In today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be trying to fix this retro tabletop game that the previous owner couldn't repair. So I know I've repaired a Firefox F7 before, but this one seemed to have an interesting fault. So let's get right into it by taking a look at the eBay listing. Grandstand Firefox F7 not working properly, only sound. I paid £5.50 plus £3.80 shipping. And the seller did provide quite a long description for this one. Grandstand Firefox F7 not working properly, only sound. He explains that he bought this about a month ago. It was untested. Tested it with a power adapter. Got sound from both speakers, but, but couldn't see the picture. So he wasn't able to repair it. Hopefully, I'll be able to fix it today. So although the seller said he tested it with a power adapter, I uh, don't happen to have one to hand. I do have batteries. So we'll try those first of all. He did, the seller did mention this was without battery cover. I got excited at the price and didn't spot that. So uh, that's a bit of a shame, but I'm sure we can do something about that. Now uh, hold the batteries in place because they will fall out. Otherwise, turn it on. And it's completely dead, absolutely nothing. Now he did say that he tested it with a power adapter. Sometimes with power adapters, if they've been used with an adapter a lot, uh, they will kind of shut off the supply to the batteries. So it might be that uh, the seller's description is accurate. In fact, uh, it still does work on a power adapter. So let's open it up and see what's going on inside. Yeah, definitely open before this one. But there again, he did kind of say almost as much in his description that in fact he bought it spares and repair and wasn't able to fix it. Oops, there we go. And there is a little trick with these. You can take the knob off and I'm going to do that anyway, but also you can just lift it up and kind of turn it around, I think, to gain access. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a faff. I'm going to have to go in here anyway, so we're going to take the knob off this. There is actually a sticker over this ordinarily. It looks like the previous person who attempted to repair it had removed the sticker, uh, but then uh, lost or not replaced it at least. Uh, but now you can lift the top straight off. Great, and we're into the game. Usual stuff, Fresnel lens actually built into the, oops, built into the display on this one, which is uh, quite nice rather than having a separate one. Kind of overlay and we're onto the board itself. I think what I'm going to do first is I'm going to put a little bit of power onto it via this jack here for my bench power supply and we'll see if it lights up and makes sounds like the seller described, in which case probably just need to clean the contacts up on that power supply connector a little bit. Uh, failing that, then the next step then is to kind of dive into diagnosing this board. Right, so we'll connect this up to the bench power supply now. I have six volts coming in here and I'm going to bypass this little connector. Just go straight into the board here. So that should bypass the switch if the switch indeed was the problem. All right, and uh, yeah, no, nothing at all. Completely dead. So it's not met the seller's description so far. It's completely dead. Now let's just try it again onto the battery terminals here. I'm sure the result will be the same. Yeah, absolutely nothing. So. Uh, not really as the seller described, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say perhaps, you know, that's how it was when he tried it. That's what happened. Uh, but then in trying it, something else has broken. But nonetheless, we'll get into this now. And the first thing I'm going to do, as I always do, is I'm going to remove the plastics. I'm going to start testing components on the board. Whenever I'm doing these repairs, I really like to remove the plastics from the electronics. It just makes working on that electronics so much easier for me. Might not be the way everybody goes, but... I like to do. Now the reason I bought this game was because it had a different fault to those which I've seen on other VFD games. So I'm hoping that there is something different here for us to repair. There we go. Let's continue just to get the plastics away from the electronics here. Right, so we have some speaker action. There we go. No, I think we're going to have to go underneath for this one. 
There we are. Not elegant, but effective. And that just leaves us with these two solder tabs onto the battery. I could probably just slide those out. No, don't. I'm going to have to unsolder them, so we'll do that. There we go. The way the seller described it was that both sound, both speakers were working. Well, the smaller speaker, I believe, is driven off this processor, which also does the gameplay and the controls. And the larger speaker, for the more complicated sounds, is driven by this. If it's a processor or a microcontroller, not quite sure what it is. Uh, but that, I think, is driving the uh, more complicated sounds that come out, kind of fire effects and so on and so forth. So this does a tune. This does the kind of shooting sounds. And they're controlled by different processors. So the fact that... He said that sound was coming out of both, suggested that both were running, and the rest of the circuitry, therefore, is to drive this VFD display. But the good news is that it hasn't been exposed to air because it has this little black spot in there. That black spot is the getter compound. It's flashed on during manufacture of the display, which is a vacuum, and it, it absorbs some of the off-gassing that goes on during the uh, normal operation of the display. If that had gone white or milky grey, uh, that would suggest that the vacuum had been compromised in the display and the display would have been valueless basically and would have had to have been replaced, but that's not the case. So I've talked about failed getter compound a lot in my videos, but I don't think I've ever shown one. Now, as luck would have it, I do have a second Firefox F7 board that I'd bought as a spare a long time ago, but that has a faulty display. So let's take a quick look at that. And you can see in this example that the getter compound has turned white. And in fact, the vacuum port has been knocked off this display, which has caused the display to fail and the getter compound to change color. Anyway, let's get back to the repair. So I'm going to start checking components on the board now. I'm going to start off with this transistor and then maybe this transistor too, and then some of the diodes. And the way that I'm going to test it this time, you've seen me test this with a multimeter on diode test a bunch of times. So actually I'm going to remove it from the board and test it with a component tester. hot. There we go. And here it is, our D882. I'm looking to see if it's got any burn marks or hot spots on it. I don't see anything like that. No, so we'll pop it straight into the component tester and we'll try it. This is of course a transistor and it's showing actually it's two resistors. So let me just try that one more time. Try it in a different orientation here. Pop it in, test. Yeah, so this D882 is showing as being uh, two resistors, and so clearly it's faulty. So I do have some new D882s, but I thought I'd try and pull one from the salvage board. It didn't work, so I pulled one from a different salvage board, and we'll test that instead. Okay, so it's recognized this one as it should be as an NPN transistor. So this is the good part. Uh, we're going to reject these, these two defective ones. So the first thing we need to do is to solder in our good D882. And we'll just position that in there and we'll solder that into place. So at this point I'm debating whether this failed transistor was just the whole cause of the problem and we could have the same problems that we've had on so many games before. So I decided to test it and find out. The way that these games are put together is such that in fact it's better to have the keypad in place to test the system otherwise you need to start jumping across the board. So I decided, you know what, let's put it all back together and see if the D882 is the problem all along even though that doesn't really explain the problem that the seller described. Oh yeah. And I have to admit that initially I thought the problem was solved, but it turns out that all is not good. Well, it sounds really quiet to me. And to be honest, the fire button isn't that responsive either. So, unfortunately, I think this needs a little bit more work. So we've disassembled everything again, or I've disassembled everything again, and we're going to start off, I think, with a couple of the easier things. So the fire button being unresponsive, I'm just going to start off here by cleaning 
the fire button contact with a little fiberglass pencil here. Uh, I didn't see any corrosion on here, but if there is any, then this will have removed it. And you know what, since we're in here, I'm going to do the same on all of these contacts. This does leave little fiberglass hairs, which are quite unpleasant. So we're going to mop those up with some IPA on a cotton bud. It's an opportunity to get any kind of built up dirt off there. One thing I have learned over time is not to blow this after you've cleaned it with the fiberglass pencil because like I say, those little fibers, you really don't want those in your eyes. So I had cleaned up these fire or these carbon buttons before with some IPA, but I think I commented at the time, which the fire button was the one that I got most of the carbon off. But if I look on the other buttons on here, I see we have a start select as well as fire. My guess is that start obviously is used quite a lot, but select probably it isn't. So I'm going to take our select pad, which is this one here, and I'm going to swap it for the fire one. So select will still work, but if it requires an extra push, then that's not a big deal, I don't think, because uh, fire is going to work uh, more responsively, and obviously responsiveness of fire is more important than responsiveness of select, as long as select works. So that's that little fix done. I'm sure that's going to make a big difference to the responsiveness of the fire button. And so then to our low audio on this speaker, as I disassembled the game here, uh, the first time around I had to remake this solder joint and the second time I see that this one has broken. So I'm thinking maybe it was just a poor solder joint on each of those, so we'll get that fixed too. Just remove it temporarily. And uh, I'm gonna just take a second just to, before I strip that back, I'm going to take a second just to look to see if there's any other things on this circuit that might be the cause of that low, low audio there. So the speaker is connected across these two terminals here, and looking at this, one side of those terminals goes to ground. So everything that is potentially of interest in that circuit is the other side of that. So it goes ground here, uh, so, sorry, ground here, and then this side is the side which is switched on the audio, and that goes up to looks like the third pin in on this side. So we'll take a look at the circuit board. One, two, three pins in here. Let's see if there's anything exciting on the other side of that. So looking at this, there is actually nothing interesting on the other side of the board from the one side of our speaker, as I say, goes to ground, and then the other one just comes straight out of the microprocessor here. And there's no capacitors of any significance is this one um, ceramic disc capacitor, but in fact those are things that are really stable and very unlikely to fail. So in fact, I think it is just probably a poor connection here which caused the low audio. Okay, good, so I think I've got some very good connections there. We'll reassemble everything now. And one last thing that I'm going to do for the sound here is and it is on a kind of foam piece, but that foam's maybe getting a little bit tired now, so I'm just going to torn a little bit off a kitchen cleaning sponge. I'm just going to pop that in the middle there, and then pop that in like so. And then when I put this on, I'll make sure then it's got very good engagement between the kind of mylar speaker cone, if you like, and the disc, whereas before I thought perhaps it wasn't contacting perfectly there. So hopefully these things together will have made a difference to the audio level. We'll assemble everything back together now and we'll see. Well, I'll be honest, it's still a little quieter than I would have liked. It works fine, sort of. The sound is perhaps a little low, as we'd said before, but then I noticed that this, which is the sound processor, oh, is getting really, really hot. Much hotter than I would expect it to be. And in fact, the current draw, especially when you first switch it on, is really, really high, and I think a lot higher than it should be. So unfortunately, I can't show you this thing getting hot because I don't have a thermal camera. But what I can show you is the current that it's drawing. So uh, maybe I can do a picture in picture if I can't figure out how to do that. I'll at least cut in the video. And let's take a look when we switch this on what the current draw is using my bench power supply. Uh, 
Uh, it's starting to get hot now. Ow! Oh, that's super hot. Super hot now. Okay, all right, so we can see that it's running hot, and hopefully we can see... Well, we can't see it's running hot. I'm telling you that it's running hot. Hopefully we can see from the current draw that it's running hot too. So a little bit of time has passed since I last looked at this. Of course, it's no time to you, but it's probably a few weeks for me, and it's just been a lot going on, and I haven't had the opportunity to return to it. Now, when I last left this, this was running really hot, this being the sound processor, and the sound was a little bit quiet. Now, I have a theory on this, and my theory is that this chip is somehow faulty. I don't know how or why, but that's my... That's what I'm thinking at the moment. Now, it could be that it has too much load on it, but the load is only from the piezo sounder. Comes straight into here, onto here, and then into this big piezo sounder here. I don't have another one of these. I can't test that, so I'm just going to have to hope that, in fact, that is good. And the problem lies with this chip, because I do have a spare board, which I showed you earlier in the video, that I can switch this chip from. I think that is probably it. There we are. So our process is now free. I have a kind of collection of IC sockets that I had bought and I thought I'd bought all common sizes, but no, I haven't. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and cut this in half. See if that will work. going to solder it into the board like so. Notice a lot of these pins are no contacts, meaning they're not connected to a track on the printed circuit assembly. All right, well it isn't the prettiest in the world, but hopefully it'll do. So what we'll do is we'll just pop this back together and make sure it's still working. And then if it is, we'll switch it out for another IC from the other game that we have. Well, this one is really quiet. And it is getting hot. Ow, oh, it's getting very hot. So I'm not having a very good day today. Can you tell that? So it wasn't the chip that was faulty then. Should unplug this really, huh? So I've got two chips now that work but run hot in there and it's too much of a coincidence, isn't it? There has to be something else that's wrong and I don't know what that something else is. So a little bit of time has passed since I last looked at this and I'm starting to suspect these capacitors. Uh, these two go across uh, the power supply there. I think these are part of the power generation. So I'm just gonna go ahead and recap this. I think it's gonna run just as hot as it did before, but we'll try it. And of course, it's still running hot. This thing is mad hot when I use it. So yet another massive disappointment for the capacitor fetishist there. Let's see what else could be wrong. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to check all of these resistors. Now, I haven't seen a resistor fail, but that doesn't mean to say that it couldn't or it wouldn't. In other words, there isn't much left to test and I'm getting desperate. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, rather than me try and read all the values, and they're probably going to be different in circuit anyway, I'm just going to take measurements on this board in circuit and compare them to measurements that I've taken on this board. So as I pointlessly measure resistor values, I'd just like to thank you for watching the video this far. All comments, likes, dislikes, and of course new subscribers are really appreciated, and I do my best to answer any comments and questions I receive. Not all of my videos are as bad as this, so please don't let it stop you checking out my other content. But for now, let's get back to our repair. The resistors measured the same on these two boards. So I have to say that didn't come as a huge surprise, but it's still not very good news. So, as I was looking at this board and as I was doing that, I've noticed, when I look at the board here, you can see the soldering is very neat. When I look at the soldering on this side, it's not great. So, good soldering at this end, 
not great soldering at the other. So I had inspected this board already, but I'm going to take a look at this board now through my magnifier and see if I can see anything wrong with it. Hmm. And indeed, I did. I don't know if you're going to be able to capture this on the camera, but it looks like there is a bridge between two of these tracks. And interestingly, one of those tracks goes to our sounder. So maybe we're trying to drive something that shouldn't be driven. If you can see that there. We're going to take a still shot of that, cut it back in. So here is our solder bridge, and I'm pretty sure that this has been the cause of our low audio problem all along. The now infamous D882 transistor was defective as well, but wasn't the cause of all of the problems that this game had. Whether it left the factory this way, or whether it's something that a previous owner did attempting to repair a problem, who knows. But a quick dab of the soldering iron should have it fixed, and we can reassemble the game now and take a look at how it plays. And all I'm going to try and do is just separate those two right now using my soldering iron. I'll take a look at that under the magnifying glass to make sure that they have separated correctly. And indeed they have. We'll hook it back up to the power supply. We'll see if the problem has been resolved. It's certainly sounding louder. The current drawer is much less. The moment of truth. And the chip isn't running hot, ladies and gentlemen a short circuit across two of the connectors on what looks to be a badly soldered connector. After all that, it wasn't the IC, it wasn't the electrolytic capacitors, it was none of these diodes that we've been through, even the little diode before. It wasn't the fault of this transistor, although this transistor did need to be replaced. It was the fault all along of a solder bridge on this connector right here. And so ends the tale of our Firefox F7. And as I complete the final assembly, only a battery door remains between us and a finished game. So you might remember when we started this that I said I don't normally buy things that don't have a battery door. Well, as luck would have it, that somebody has had battery doors remanufactured for Astro Wars and uh, Firefox F7s. And so I was able to buy one of these online. It's not a cheap kind of um, 3D print. It's actually a, quite a nice molded piece. And whilst it's not a perfect fit, it's, it's pretty darn good. And there we have it. Uh, I'll clean up the desk and we'll have a quick look how this plays. So as I mentioned, I've repaired a Firefox F7 on the channel before, so I'm not going to play through all of the levels here. If you'd like to see a more comprehensive playthrough, take a look at the other video. But I guess that just about wraps it up for this repair today, and it just goes to show that sometimes the simplest things are worth checking first before you assume that the problem is a more complicated one. Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed the video today, and that if you have, you'll consider hitting subscribe. But until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. And off we come with a lid.